Funding for Principal Punishment and Redemption is made possible by generous support from ASC. Ensuring access to an excellent, relevant, and sustainable cultural community for the Charlotte-Mecklenburg region. This is truly a historic day in our city and in our country. A 20th century unresolved battle carried out at segregated lunch counters returned to a South Carolina court of law. Don't quit. Stand there. Take it. Sometimes uh, might be life-threatening. It was. Sentence, $100 or 30 days. Conditions sent to chain gang. State-ordered prosecution came for the civil rights demonstrators. The Friendship Nine strategy of opting for jail rather than paying their fine became known as jail, no bail. Flashbacks years later detail their hardship. We didn't realize, truly realize the consequences of going to jail. Faded headlines brought hope and interest from the town solicitor. That the segregated lunch counters in Rock Hill and across the South were wrong. Justice is for all. We must never forget that fact. But freedom for all was part of the Civil Rights Act. Their valued voices were discovered by a book author who couldn't let their story go. They were a pivotal part of civil rights history, so I think it's important that we know who the Friendship Nine men are. The narrative touched hearts and contributed to the reversal of a once painful legal decision. Got gratitude here, I'm, I'm excited, I, all of it together, but it's good, it's a good thing, it's a good feeling. Main Street, Rock Hill, South Carolina. In many ways, it looks a lot different than it did in the 1960s. And one stirring reminder points to a struggle carried out here to help move a nation forward. Hello and welcome, I'm Steve Crump. The heroics of the Friendship Nine were rooted in the values and virtues of nonviolence. It's been said and written that these men sat down allowing many others to stand up, but it all came with a very stiff price, personal pain and time in jail. Life Sunset Years has provided a new opportunity along their path of standing on principle, enduring punishment, and finding redemption. Curious admirers were drawn to every available seat inside of a South Carolina courtroom. Witnesses who are wanting to see and be a part of compelling history. Admission to the proceedings on the morning of January 28, 2015 meant scoring one tough ticket to get. And that's because the day's events at the Rock Hill Law Center were solidly rooted in substance, symbolism, and carried out in a community decades later coming to its senses. This is a great day. I never thought that I'd be here to see it. The Lord let me live on and I'm going to appreciate it. I'm going to thank him every day. I'm speechless. Okay. It's good to be here. It's time. A new time wow. and a new day had finally come to correct a blatant, gross, and deliberate injustice Conditions carried out through the legal system that happened 54 years earlier for the surviving members of the town's Friendship Nine. We are pleased to be hosting these proceedings today and are honored with so many distinguished guests. Perhaps the best known guest, widely embraced and held in high esteem, was former South Carolina Supreme Court Chief Justice Ernest Finney. Today I am honored and proud to move this honorable court to vacate the convictions of my clients. He served as defense counsel for the nine during their first trial back in 1961 by representing demonstrators from the town's Friendship College. Like so many other defined students of that era who rebelled against society's long-standing rituals, customs, and traditions at Southern Five and Dime stores, a special group of protesters put it all on the line in their quest for seeking fair and equal treatment. The segregated lunch counters in Rock Hill and across the South were wrong, and that the policies and laws that supported these segregated counters and other segregated facilities, public facilities in the South, were wrong. The original court docket listing the names, offenses, and penalties offers the sobering and telling reminders of the heavy burden endured by the African-American students. Docket number 409, prisoner Clarence Henry Graham. 
Offense, trespassing, disposition, guilty, sentence, $100 or 30 days, conditions, sent to chain gang. Bringing the original documents to these proceedings on this occasion wasn't for show, but rather to dramatize the importance of setting the record straight. Docket number 414, prisoner, Willie Thomas Massey. Offense, trespassing, disposition, guilty, $100 or 30 days, sent to chain gang. Recurring flashbacks for these men from more than a half century ago are difficult to purge from the hardship and heartbreak they experienced on a demeaning chain gang at the now closed York County Prison Camp. There is only one reason these men were arrested. There is only one reason that they were charged and convicted for trespassing, and that is because they were black. From these Main Street lunch counters, Rock Hill, South Carolina entered its place onto the American Civil Rights timeline by giving birth to a fresh concept billed as jail, no bail. Strategy carried out was firmly rooted in a guiding principle, serve the time, don't pay the fine, and let the state pick up the tab for housing and feeding the inmates. These courageous and determined South Carolinians have shown by their conduct and the faith, the relief that they seek should be granted. Segregation was an unjust law. Removing the charges and, and having their records vacated turned into a self-imposed mission carried out by solicitor Kevin Brackett. So allow me to take this opportunity to extend to each of you my heartfelt apologies for what happened to you in 1961. It was wrong. However, in the environment of newfound justice, belated and extended apologies underscore the importance of equality and the viewpoint of righteousness that was applauded by their lawyer of more than 50 years ago. Let the decision of the court today show the resolve of South Carolina to work together, to learn together, and to progress together, and to ensure the promises set forth in our Constitution that all men are equal under the law. Understanding the context of this determined fight for equality in Rock Hill, South Carolina, requires comprehending a similar battle that was first launched 120 miles away. Greensboro, North Carolina is often credited as the birthplace of America's sit-in movement. It is the Piedmont City where students from North Carolina A&T University one of the state's historically black universities, created a well-documented firestorm of social activism and change that first began at the downtown Woolworths on February 1st, 1960. But we were just astonished about how fast it did spread. And not only were we astonished about it, but it was sort of a help to us back in Greensboro, because I think people even in Greensboro saw that, hey, this is not going to be just Greensboro. I mean, soon it's going to be the entire South and all across this country. To friends and strangers alike, the late Franklin McCain, who died in 2014, is remembered as a treasure trailblazer. This standing tribute to McCain and the other three A&T students who broke new ground is a cherished part of the campus landscape. The four freshmen are often credited for their courage, bravery, and innovation by serving notice on a regulated system of inequality. I don't think we got to the point where we were thinking that, well, when we do this, it's going to be High Point, North Carolina tomorrow, and Danville, Virginia the next day, and, and Fayetteville the next day, and Winston-Salem the next day. I don't think we thought that way at all. Uh, and, and of course, it was good that other cities did pick up, uh, pick up the very uh, thought that, hey, the city will work here and we should do it. Uh, but we were just astonished about how fast it did spread. The ripple effect of images and headlines inspired a future congressman to follow a similar path as a student in Nashville, Tennessee. And because of what these young people did, their courage, their raw courage, we are a better people. We are a better nation. Rock Hill, South Carolina is the place where Georgia Representative John Lewis endured an attack during the Freedom Rides in 1961, not long after the Friendship Nine went to jail. Elwin Wilson, 
a former Klansman, admitted to the act and eventually apologized for his role in the violence. Lewis, in 1961, was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and four years later became a victim of police brutality on Selma, Alabama's Edmund Pettus Bridge while seeking the right to vote. He remains inspired by a grassroots exercise that gathered steam across many college campuses. It was like a snowball. It just kept rolling. And who's next? What city? Atlanta, Jackson, Mississippi, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, Greenville, South Carolina, Rock Hill, South Carolina. Less than 30 miles north of Rock Hill, in the Carolina's largest city, Charlotte. The wildfire of student protest raged at Johnson C. Smith University. Passionate demonstrators from JCSU embarked upon the same mission just days after an unprecedented level of activism took hold in Greensboro. Some got on the bus and went, some caught the city bus and went to town, some hitchhiked to town. Collective efforts in North Carolina's largest communities paid off. Within six months, the limiting barriers of segregation were removed in a number of locales across the Tar Heel State, including places such as Charlotte and Greensboro. But that would not be the case in South Carolina, where the protests to end discrimination raged on. Celebrated events paid tribute to the 50th anniversary of America's sit-in movement in Greensboro, North Carolina back in 2010. During this period of reflection, five surviving members of the Friendship Nine returned to the counter where they were arrested as teenagers. We didn't know, at least I didn't know at the time, that this was such a courageous feat until it got the attention of just about everybody imaginable in this area. Willie McLeod, Dub Massey, James Wells, Clarence Graham, and David Williamson recall the moments, events, and critical thinking that altered their lives. The way things happened, uh, there were, there, the law was the law needed to be changed, first of all. A lot of things in the law, on the books, were wrong. Dedication to the cause and commitment to equality were routinely carried out in these streets, and that meant being rounded up, taken to jail, paying a penalty, and living to fight another day. However, by shining a bright light on legalized discrimination, members of this group were determined to carry out what could be called a game changer. They were here waiting on us when we was coming up the street. An irreversible line in the sand was deeply etched at McCrory's on Main Street during January 31st, 1961. It threw more fuel on an explosive conflict that erupted some 13 months after the fight at these counters began. I sat on the stool on the end down there, and all I remember is going down like that, next thing I know he, I just snatched me up, took me out through the back door, slammed me into the back door in the back back there. Like David said, we barely had time to sit down and order anything before the policeman was on us. They didn't have fun to take us. They drove us out the back. Right to the jailhouse. Yeah. It was kind of excitement along with fear. I think some of us were, were, were more scared than others. Headlines and editorials from the African American press brought attention to the jail no bail concept pioneered by the Friendship Nine. We had spent a lot of time organizing. Thomas Gaither would write in the 1961 Congress of Racial Equality publication titled Jailed In that being locked up meant bringing their college textbooks with them, but they were not allowed to study. Now, why did I go there in the first place? I went there in the first place because uh, it's not logical that you can go into a public establishment and you can shop at every counter in the establishment and it, they welcome your money, but when you sit at a lunch counter, suddenly there is an issue that they would not serve you at a lunch counter. The moment that changed their lives is deeply woven within their collective psyche.
And he hit that gambling hundred dollars thirty day. I said, Oh Lord, that was it. And see, then that by that afternoon, we was on a chain gang. Assigned to a chain gang at the York County prison camp, their task was filling dump trucks with sand. We were placed together as a group of people who were students and friends, but we spent a month together uh, in a place that we really didn't, didn't want to be, but was there for a reason. The crowds would come on Sunday. They would want to get in to see us. Reinforcements also came to Rock Hill from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and four of its members also chose jail. Among them was Diane Nash, who got headlines in the black press for leading a similar effort in Nashville. While Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail attracted national attention for calling out a system of inequality, a similar letter emerged out of the Rock Hill protest two years earlier. Like Dr. King, Nash said, we are trying to focus attention on a moral question. People started talking about it and they started thinking about it and uh, I think it caused the country to grow. The black prisoner told us don't y'all worry about it. saying anybody mess with you let us know. And the fact that we were there together kind of kept my feelings my emotions what it should be. Hey we went into this together and we've got to stick through it. We got 30 days to do here we'll do this. For more than a half century Documented arrest records and courthouse convictions followed the jail students into their years of retirement. They feared such a moment of vindication would never happen in their lifetimes. Robert McCullough, one member of the group, died during 2006, nearly 10 years before a new day would come in court. Repeated efforts for their names to be cleared failed in the South Carolina legislature. During one session, State Representative John King introduced a bill that would exonerate the Friendship Nine. His proposal stalled in committee. I, I don't think that many people um, understand the impact of the Friendship Nine that's on a state level. I don't think that it has had the publicity that it needs throughout the state of South Carolina. Before their cases were revisited in the South Carolina courts, help came from an unlikely place. Justice is for all. We must never forget that fact. But freedom for all was part of the Civil Rights Act. Their plight became an obsession for Dr. Kimberly Johnson. Her children's book is titled, No Fear for Freedom, The Story of the Friendship Nine. They were ordinary men who just decided to do something. And at the time, they didn't know even what they were doing was going to be so profound. They just really got tired. They said, you get to a point in your life when you're tired of not being able to go eat where you like to eat. There's a point you get tired of not being able to try on clothes when you spend your hard-earned money. So they, want, they were just tired. Johnson's powerful and compelling narrative got the attention of solicitor Kevin Brackett. Kimberly has really done a great job getting their story out there. She's her, the, the, the book that she wrote, I think, has done a marvelous job, not only of just sort of condensing the story down, but also making it accessible to kids, which is really important. Her publication was a major influence on Brackett, who re-examined the case and arrived at a long-awaited solution. What we really need to do is get them back into court. What we, we need to do is figure out a way that, uh, that we can get these gentlemen back into court and give them an opportunity to contest the conviction and have it vacated. And so that's the, the, how this got started. As our country continues to learn how to respect, love, and share, we must also know that the work of others makes our country fair. When we all come together to put our differences aside, there will be no room left for racism if that's what we decide. Johnson's vision helped open the door by assisting this group's journey to justice. They were peaceful. They were nonviolent and they were hopeful. And so those three things, if we can plant those seeds in people who are interested in their story, we have a shot at making things better. While President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 outlawing discrimination, it didn't erase the earlier convictions of the Friendship Nine. I therefore order that the defendant's motion for a new trial based on after discovered evidence is granted. The defendant's convictions for trespassing in January of 1961 are vacated, no void, and set aside. On the day they were exonerated, turning the other cheek and erasing a 54-year criminal record 
took all of 33 minutes. And I am now signing the order, and that is done. Now. Gratitude for the nine was expressed on behalf of the group by Clarence Grand. I say from this point on, I can hold my head up. It's a little bit down, but a little bit higher. And I think that God is going to let us live a little bit longer just because of it. Enjoy some of the quote-unquote freedom. Clarence Graham's words could be described as insightful. It wasn't just the records of the men from Friendship College erased on that day, but individuals such as Charles Jones and three of the members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee were also given clean slates by the courts of South Carolina. I took this moment to speak for all of us, to tell you how lifted we are. Can you feel, can you imagine after all this time and, and here we are before the globe being respected and we never thought that that would happen. We believe but we never imagined that at this moment in time, in this place and space in your county. Also front and center on that day was the daughter of an American icon, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Reverend Bernice King applauded the risk carried out on Main Street that continued as a 21st century adventure. So thank you, uh, Friendship Nine and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee for embracing that leadership and embracing that model of nonviolent social change. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart for your sacrifice, for your bravery, for your courage, and now you have your dignity restored. Public accolades come with a rock star's welcome following their charges being thrown out for a well-documented act of public defiance. In Rock Hill and elsewhere, the group once jailed has seen its status soar from reviled to revered. We only did it for one reason only, to make a better world. Not just for black, it's for everyone. The sweetness of vindication existed on borrowed time for one of the nine. Clarence Graham would die in March of 2016, some 14 months after appearing in court. Pews were packed at Boyd Hill Baptist Church. Graham's commitment to a cause was clearly echoed by those in Rock Hill's positions of power. And how he continued to share his driving motivation that all people, all people deserve a fair and just opportunity in life. Expressions of grateful praise were also delivered by the author who made sure youngsters would learn the importance carried out by Graham and his colleagues. Mr. Graham died at age 73, a pillar of grace, a soldier of peace, a man of incredible dignity. He was not only a civil rights veteran, but also a Vietnam War veteran. And on the day of his funeral, an attention-getting tribute could be found at the lunch counter where Graham and the eight others began a path towards equality. Outside of the church, more accolades came from the solicitor who helped him get his good name back. The accomplishments of that movement were the major accomplishments were performed by average folks just like Clarence Graham. Those who did time with him called Clarence Graham their leader. I am happy for him because, you know, he had peace. Because a lot of things that happened in his life, he did a lot of crime. Clarence was um, the epitome <laughs> of a person who was determined uh, to get things right when it comes to um, the races. As much as it was a send-off for Graham, this occasion provided a meaningful opportunity of thanks, not just to him, but to so many others who were fearless at these establishments during 1961. What began on Rock Hill's Main Street more than five decades ago 
exemplifies a commitment to the cause of being treated equally. Their courage was also acknowledged by former Vice President Joseph Biden, who visited the old McCrory's lunch counter. I can remember the nine. I can't, I mean, really, it was, I mean, it's my age, I'm, you know, graduated in 61, I can remember what happened in this, what was a five and dime story. Applause for these men came because they never gave up the fight, found years later in a South Carolina courtroom, that equality would be served, delivered, and honored in its rightful place. No one but the big guy upstairs uh, would keep his hands on us and allow us to do what we did. The sacrifice carried out by members of the Friendship Nine in many circles can be viewed as a badge of honor. It was a complicated journey, one that demonstrates the point to people who sat in up and down this block that justice doesn't always come easy or overnight. That's principle, punishment, and redemption. From Rock Hills Main Street, I'm Steve Crump. Thanks so much for joining us.